My name is Karen de Blasio. I'm the Division Director in the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs. Thank you for joining us today to hear a little bit more about monitoring your CARES Act ESG allocation. Um, just a couple of things before I introduce the staff and um, that will be presenting to you. Um, first, I just want to thank all of you for all of the very hard work that you guys have been doing. We knew before the pandemic how hard our recipients worked, and um, you guys have just blown it out of the water since uh, March 2020. So just know that we appreciate it on behalf of myself, Norm Suchar, the office director, and our um, uh, Jameen Bryan, our Deputy Assistant Secretary of Special Needs. Um, they send their thank you uh, to you all today as well. Um, we to, This session today is really, we wanted to provide an opportunity for you all to hear from us and for you all to ask questions, um, again, regarding um, monitoring your CARES Act allocation. Um, we are going to go over, uh, do an overview of HUD's monitoring process. Um, we're going to give you some tips of things that you can do as recipients in order to prep or get prepared um, to be monitored by HUD. Um, we have, as I said, I'll be introducing a couple of staff from my office, the SNAPS office, um, who will be uh, in, uh, reviewing some, um, some pieces with you regarding the monitoring, and they'll also be answering your questions. Um, we also have a lot of great uh, guidance pieces that have been uh, produced that we'll be releasing soon um, from our technical assistance providers, and these are also pieces that we think will help you all um, prepare for monitoring your CARES Act allocation, so we'll go over those as well. Um, please use the chat. They just went over how, how to do that, um, so please use the chat. We encourage you to ask questions. Um, please, no question you know, is a dumb question, or we're not going to look at you and say, oh, we need to monitor them because they asked that question. That's not how it works, so please, please, please ask questions. Do not be shy um, you know, in asking your questions because everybody will, you know, will benefit, I'm sure, for any question that you have. Um, so just to go over the agenda very quickly, um, there's a, we'll have a monitoring overview, um, a little bit of the understanding of the process, what it looks like on HUD side and your side, um, some uh, compliance focus areas that we're going to be focus on, focusing on when we monitor, um, and we also will have a compliance top 10, um, things that we see um, when the field uh, goes out to monitor. I think that um, a lot of compliance issues are some of the most common compliance issues. Um, again, a little discussion around preparing for monitoring and a discussion around subrecipient oversight and monitoring. So the next slide just has the list of staff that you'll be hearing from today. Um, Marlisa Grogan in the SNAPS office and Tammy Thomas. Um, Marlisa is the, the um, senior SNAP specialist that's over the ESG program and over the CARES Act allocation. Tammy is our uh, senior SNAPper that is um, responsible for compliance monitoring. Um, Jill Casey is in the uh, HUD Buffalo field office. Mark Sorbo, Sorbo sorry, um, is from the Detroit field office. And Mandy Wampler is in the Philadelphia field office, and they are all with us as well today. And Nora Lally from Home Base is also on, and you will be hearing from everybody. Um, so uh, without further ado, I want to hand it over to them because those are the folks that are going to give you all the great information that you need about monitoring. So thank you. Thanks, Karen. Next slide, please. We know this is really on the forefront of your minds along with so many other pressing issues, but we wanted to at least take a chance with this CARES Act virtual conference to touch base with you all about monitoring, how to prepare, try to put your mind at ease and um, give you some tips so that you feel like you're as prepared as possible going into the monitoring season. Next slide, please. So if there's one takeaway from this section of the presentation, it's that this is not going to be a whole new monitoring process, that we are not reinventing the wheel and that we are um, building on the building blocks that should be familiar to you, having been monitored, um, hopefully in the past, either through um, the ESG program or another program. So this should look largely familiar to you, that HUD uses a risk-based approach and that this is done in an annual process for all funded grantees, and it's a process, the risk analysis is done by CPD field staff. So while you may score as a high-risk grantee according to certain criteria um, and always be monitored or almost always be monitored, um, it doesn't, it's not a necessarily a one-for-one -one, um, correlation, sometimes medium or low risk 
uh, grantees are submitted as well. So if you are notified that you will be monitored, it's not an indication necessarily that you're a high risk grantee. Um, it just means that due to uh, certain criteria that we're prioritizing, that um, it's been necessary for you to be monitored. Maybe it's that you haven't been monitored in a really long time. And we'll also get into uh, some of those factors in later on in the presentation. There's a new risk analysis notice that's being drafted. It's also including the ESG CV program as well as other CARES Act programs. And that is on its way to being published soon. As you all are probably familiar, there's a CPD monitoring handbook, and we've linked to that in the slides, which will be available to you. This is a guide for uh, the selection of specific review areas for ESG. That would be shelter, street outreach, homelessness prevention, rapid rehousing, along with um, grantee oversight, subrecipient oversight. So these are all of the very specific or the specific areas that are monitored as part of regular ESG. Um, the exhibits are used to uh, verify your regulatory compliance. And we are working on finalizing all of the ESG CV exhibits as well. So they, are, they should be shortly going through the clearance process. So we're moving along with that as well. And specifically for fiscal year 2022 monitoring, we're expecting, and this is not hard and fast guidance, but we're expecting that we're gonna start as remote just because of where we are um, due to the pandemic situation. And we're also expecting that the monitorings will be conducted by CPD field office staff with headquarters staff participation. Um, and you know, typically the field off the CPD field office staff, they take a central role. They still will have a central role for ESG CV monitoring, but we do have CARES Act staff that were specifically hired for um, ESG CV administrative support. So you you Hopefully have been in contact with your CPD, um, your SNAPS CARES Act desk officer, and those CARES Act staff are also going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to ESG CV monitoring. As always, you'll receive notification ahead of time. So this is not a situation where you're going to be scrambling at the last minute um, due to like a, a letter that you receive on a Friday and feeling like you're getting monitored on a Monday. You're still going to have the same sort of um, advance notice. So we're not trying to throw any curveballs, but you will be um, notified ahead of time. So you can, you can take um, steps to prepare. Next slide, please. These are the usual suspects when it comes to monitoring. Um, HUD headquarters, which as I said, will take a more of an involved role with ESG CV monitoring in particular due to the CARES Act staff roles, but HUD field staff will also be playing a prominent role in monitoring. And then you, the recipient, as well as your subrecipients um, are all gonna be playing a part as you all are probably familiar that um, subrecipient monitoring is part of the process. And um, what would a monitoring visit be without pulling some of the case files and doing some of the case file review? So that's definitely a part of who's involved. Next slide, please. So the purpose of monitoring is primarily compliance. We prioritize uh, the compliant use of public resources. We have to make sure that you all are on the right track using the funds according to the regulations. And field office reps, they are also really invested in making sure that grantees are being as effective as they can and that the delivery that's needed to programs in the community are done in, in an effective and efficient way. So monitoring, um, while it is very centrally part of compliance monitoring, it's also a really good opportunity to see the, the positive impacts that you all are making with the, with the funding, celebrate successes, lift up promising practices so that um, we can share those with other recipients and that they can, um, they can make use of the, of the lessons that you as a community have learned. So we very much wanna frame monitoring as an opportunity to identify which areas need improvement, which um, areas can be worked on together as HUD staff, grantees, TA providers. Uh, while I think there's typically like a punitive nature around monitoring, we as HUD staff that go out and do the monitoring really do um, find it 
a positive experience in many cases to learn more about what's going on so we can we can learn from you and we can promote those um, those successes. Next slide, please. Uh, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Mandy. Am I right, Mandy? Yeah, it's me, Marlisa. Thank you so much. Process. Thanks. Great. You can hear me? Good. Great. Well, that was really helpful framing. Um, and, you know, one of our goals today is to really demystify the CPD monitoring process. Some of you will be monitored this year, but you won't all be monitored. And um, some of you maybe have been monitored or you will be monitored in future years. But either way, we want to make sure that you know what to expect and have a sense of what HUD is looking for. Um, and as we go throughout the presentation, I think there's going to be a lot of good information that will apply to you, whether or not you're being monitored this year or, or next year. Next slide, please. So in understanding the monitoring process, uh, we want to just reiterate that it really looks the same for ESGCV as it does for ESG. On this slide, we see a roadmap of the monitoring process. And uh, Marlisa touched on some of this, but it starts with CPD's own risk analysis in which defined factors are reviewed for all grantees and CPD programs. Uh, the grantee and the program selections are made, and then there will be a monitoring work plan that is developed um, the monitor, the grantee will be monitored. Um, you'll receive a notification letter, um, which is formal notification of the monitoring and the areas that will be reviewed. And then after the monitoring, you'll receive a report which outlines the results, and then you'll work to resolve those findings. So we're going to go into more detail on this, but this is just a quick snapshot of the, the roadmap. Next slide, please. So to break this down in more detail, if you're selected for monitoring, there's going to be some informal consultation uh, between you and your monitor. And this will be where you can discuss um, your schedule, your availability. You'll hear about some of the areas that are going to be reviewed um, so that, you know, everyone is set up for success here. Like Marlisa said, we're not just going to come knocking without some notice, without your ability to weigh in on your availability. Um, you'll receive a notification letter, which is your formal notification, and this really includes the who, what, when, where, and how of the monitoring. So it will include the monitoring dates and who will be conducting the review and what documents are needed. Um, no monitoring can look at every single aspect of a grantee's CPD programming, and so this letter will outline the scope of the monitoring. It will include which activities will be reviewed and which monitoring exhibits will be used to conduct that review. And it will identify the documents that you'll need to provide and how those documents can be transmitted. Uh, Marlisa mentioned that we're starting off our monitoring in fiscal year 2022 uh, remotely. And beginning last year in fiscal year 2021, CPD began using what we call a grantee document exchange or GDX to facilitate the electronic uploading of monitoring documents into one portal. So whereas in the past, we may have sent a whole flurry of emails back and forth to transmit documents, um, we now have an established portal. And your monitor, your either the field office or someone from headquarters, would give you really clear and good instructions on how to use that portal. So the monitoring event can take anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. And that is when you would be very accessible to your monitor and you'd have their full attention. Um, the monitoring, the end of the monitoring would be marked by an exit conference in which it's time to discuss the results of the review, both the good and maybe some of the issues that were found. Um, you'll receive the results of the review in a monitoring report, um, which will be a very detailed description of what was reviewed and the results. Um, and you'll typically would get that monitoring report within 60 days of the monitoring, and then you would work on resolving those findings. Next slide, please. Okay, so what's included in an ESG or ESG CV monitoring review? Um, HUD would be looking at both your policies and procedures and your client files. So all monitoring includes a review of a sample of your client files. 
and uh, we would select those um, and would be reviewing for client eligibility and that you have the appropriate intake documentation. So those things are given. All monitorings, we would need to provide your policies and procedures, sometimes called standard operating procedures, um, and then you would be providing some client files for review. Um, then there's a lot of things that could be reviewed depending on the scope of the particular review. So you will not be surprised by this. You will know in advance what the scope, scope of that review is going to be, um, and that will dictate the specific activities that are being reviewed. So that might mean your emergency shelter, your street outreach, your rapid rehousing, your homeless prevention activities. Um, we can't look at everything, so we would be selecting um, some specific review areas. HUD might also be reviewing for compliance with financial management requirements, and this has become an increased focus recently. So, you know, there's a good chance that we would be digging into your financial management compliance. Um, and then we might also be reviewing for cross-cutting requirements, such as lead-based paint. So again, this would be defined by the specific scope of the review that gets communicated to you by your reviewer. Next slide, please. A couple of key points regarding CPD monitoring. So monitoring is distinctive from an audit. Um, it's usually more limited. It's a little bit more limited in its time frame. It's a smaller sample size usually. And because of a smaller sample size, it's usually less definitive in its conclusions. Um, so for HUD monitoring, we're taking a sample and we're saying, okay, based on this sample that we've reviewed, do we see that you've demonstrated compliance with overall requirements? Um, File access is a key part of monitoring. So you'll need to provide your reviewer with access to all required requested documentation. And this might mean documentation that's being maintained by your subrecipients. And you'll need to be fully accessible during monitoring. So once you understand the scope of the review, you'll need to think carefully about who on your team needs to be included and who needs to be available. This might mean, um, folks from your financial division if you're being reviewed for compliance with financial management requirements. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's a not so secret secret. It's not a secret at all, really. There are no trick questions in monitoring. Um, it is not a gotcha exercise. Um, it is a review uh, to see if you're complying with the requirements. So, it's much more like a take-home test and a test that you already have. Um, we use monitoring exhibits to guide our review, and those monitoring exhibits are all publicly available to everyone on the website. Um, and while the ESG CV exhibits aren't available yet, the ESG exhibits are, and they can be your guide for the time being. So there is a link on this slide to the monitoring handbook. We'll be referring to exhibits throughout this presentation. Um, but chapter 28 is the ESG chapter. We find the financial management exhibits in chapter 34. We kind of refer to those as like cross-cutting, meaning they apply to most, if not all of the CPD programs. Um, and then there's lead-based paint exhibits in chapter 24, which would also be considered a cross-cutting requirements because they apply to um, all of the CPD programs. Next slide. So we will let you check out the link to the monitoring handbook yourself, uh, but we want to give a brief orientation to what's there. So when you arrive on the page, uh, you will see all of the exhibits for all of the CPD programs on that landing page. And you'll see some initial instructions at, um, at the start, some instructions for the handbook at the start. Next slide. Okay, so you probably care most about what's in these exhibits. And so we want to share an overview of how the exhibits work, and then we'll take a look at a screenshot of the exhibit so you can, can understand what we're talking about a little bit more specifically. The exhibits are designed to walk through each regulatory requirement, and it's really a set of questions set up like a checklist. You can read instructions at the beginning of every exhibit to kind of see how the exhibits apply and how they function. Um, but then, like I said, it's really um, like a checklist and there's a series of questions and those questions um, usually include a regulatory citation. 
Um, if there's a regulatory citation, it means that compliance is required. And if there's a no to that question, meaning compliance can't be demonstrated, then it would result in a finding. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, if there's no regulatory citation, then it reflects that it's really just like a best practice or it's kind of a best performance uh, type of element. And so if you can't demonstrate compliance, uh, it would be something that we would note to you, but we would note it as a concern and not as a finding. Um, so the goal really is to take these exhibits, take these checklists and to see yes, 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 yes. Um, maybe not applicable if the requirements don't apply, but looking for yeses and looking for documentation to demonstrate compliance uh, to be able to mark each question yes. Next slide, please. Okay, so when you land on the CPD monitoring handbook, like I said, you're gonna see a long list of exhibits because all of the CPD exhibits are listed there. Scroll down to chapter 28 and we see the ESG uh, program exhibits found here and the ESG CV exhibits will, will land here as well. Um, these are the exhibits for ESG and like um, I mentioned just a short while ago, exhibit 28-1 will always be used. So that has a little star there. Um, next slide, please. Okay. All right. So this is a screenshot of exhibit 28-1, really just an example. Um, I could have screen grabbed any of the exhibits, uh, but this is how they look. There's some basic information about what's being reviewed and who's doing that review at the top and some instructions for the exhibit. And then there's a series of questions. If you can go to the next slide, please. So this is just one, this one example, this is question number seven on this exhibit. Um, and this question is asking about for a program participant that qualified under paragraph one of the homeless definition um, is one of these things in the file. So this is speaking to uh, homeless status and eligibility for participation in the program. And the reviewer would be looking for documentation in your files to demonstrate one of these things, A, B, C, or D. So uh, the reviewer would take this question, would have your client, the client files in front of them, and, and they would be describing what they found and providing a response to this question based on um, the results. So that's how the exhibits work. Um, again, they're available for everyone. The link is there. It's really a great exercise to work your way through. Um, and they're, they're a helpful tool and resource for you, even if you're not being monitored. Next slide. So after the monitoring event, after your HUD reviewer has been with you remotely or on site and worked their way through all of the required review areas, they will take the results of that review and they will go back and they will um, work on drafting a monitoring report. And this conveys the results of the monitoring. So as I think I mentioned, that monitoring report will summarize the scope of the review and what was found. And sometimes, you know, everything looks great or lots of things look great. And that's wonderful. The report will talk about where there was compliance, um, what was reviewed and what was the result. That could include exemplary practices that were identified or, you know, just a notation to say, like, things looked good. This is what you were using to demonstrate compliance. Um, and sometimes if there are issues, there will also be findings issued as part of the monitoring report. So a finding is a regulatory violation. It means it needs to be fixed or it needs to be addressed in some way. Um, so in the report, there will be a finding, there will be some discussion around the finding. So what was found, what was the regula regulation that was um, violated, what was the cause, what was the effect, and then what's the corrective action. So what needs to happen in order to resolve this noncompliance. So that will be in the report for you. Um, and then um, a concern would be something that's maybe a program deficiency that's not a regulatory violation that would also be in the report. So that's kind of the end product um, that you would receive from your reviewer. Next slide, please. So a little discussion here of why do issues arise? And this is not a complete list, but um, some of the, the patterns that we, we see, um, I'm just a pass through. So this is an assumption that subrecipients are doing things right. 
um, that uh, state recipients are doing things right without proper oversight and a proper acknowledgement that the recipient is responsible for compliance and needs to have like the training in place and the agreements in place and the oversight in place to make sure that that compliance is happening. Another one, my predecessor did it. So absolutely, physicians turn over. Some of these issues that are identified were issues that were established, patterns that were established under other folks on your team. Monitoring is not about assigning blame, and it's not about saying who did what and when. Um, it's just about the grantee as an entity being responsible for program compliance. With that said, it is helpful for HUD to understand why an issue arose so that we can help figure out, okay, this was the issue, this is why it happened, we call it the cause, and then what can we do to, to make it right? Next slide. So post-monitoring, you get your monitoring report. Um, your monitor will always be available to you. Um, but it's at this point that you're going to be working on wrapping up any of the findings on corrective actions that were identified in that report. And we really want to impart to you, we know it's tough to find the time to address this stuff, but really it's important to address them timely. Um, if they drag on for years, it's just kind of a thorn in everyone's paw, and also they can increase your future risk score, uh, having open monitoring findings year after year like that. And we, we get it. Sometimes there's like complicated things that need to be addressed. Your policies and procedures need to be updated and you just don't have the time to get to it. Um, so they're complex. Maybe there's, you know, uh, money that needs to be repaid, whatever it might be. But we do encourage you to find the time to, to address them. Test those corrective actions for practicality. So make sure that you're not just doing something to appease HUD, but that it's really going to work for you and your program design. Um, evaluate your program design as needed based on what was identified as part of the review. And then, you know, ask for help. And this could be technical assistance from your HUD staff person, your HUD point of contact, maybe a TA provider that you work with. So know that folks are out there to help you. And then finally, uh, I guess my main takeaway from this section is maintain a healthy perspective on monitoring. Um, Marlisa spoke at the onset about how monitoring is really an opportunity, and I think that's true. We oftentimes get really great feedback from, from grantees who are super stressed out about monitoring or just kind of scared, and then it turned out that they really got to learn a lot from their reviewer. It's an opportunity. You get HUD's undivided attention for a week, and you get to pick our brain during that time. Um, it's an opportunity to course correct, better to know sooner rather than later um, if something isn't happening exactly right. So really don't fear the finding. Um, our goal is to make things right and corrective actions can span a wide spectrum. Um, so help us understand why something went wrong. Um, help us, on, you know, we'll try to determine if this was an isolated mistake or something systemic. Um, if it's not fraud, waste and abuse, and it's just like, a mistake or an oversight, like there's gonna be a lot, like I said, a wide spectrum of ways that this can be resolved. Um, and that will be something that uh, you will, uh, can work with your HUD reviewer on. Okay, with that, I will turn it over to Jill. Thanks, Mandy. Next slide, please. I'm gonna talk about one of the, um, Mandy mentioned one of the things is cause that we include when we do write a finding. Um, so we tell you what the violation was and the why. So that should help inform your next steps. And very often the why is um, put in the policies and procedures. So we often say there isn't a policy and procedure or the policy and procedure wasn't uh, clear on the topic. So we're gonna talk about policies and procedures. Next screen, uh, next slide, please, Mark. Thank you. Next slide again. Um, there are three key components that we identified for your consideration in monitoring, and these all should be incorporated into policies and procedures. And the first one is programmatic, um, and this is this is the meat and potatoes of what you do, right? The the way that you're approaching clients the way that your program design is considered, 
Um, and this is the things that we're looking for are, did you serve the population you told us you were gonna serve? Did you deliver the program in the manner in which you proposed? Um, and always are these things gonna be documented? So that's evidence is important in monitoring. It's how we make our determination and draw our conclusions of your compliance, very evidentiary. So having the documentation is really critical to having good monitoring outcomes. So that, that programmatic one is what we find so many of our grantees are good at, right? You're really great at serving clients generally. There's always a line and, and you have a good handle on who you propose to serve. Sometimes it's the documentation that's the tricky part. So we're gonna give you some tips on each of these things as we go along. So program compliance. The second one is financial compliance. Are the books in order? Did you spend your money according to the budget that you proposed to HUD? And do you have a system that allows your transactions to be adequately documented for review? We're gonna follow the money. Very frequently we do financial monitoring uh, as part of our programmatic monitoring. And so we are comparing client files to financial transactions. If you're paying rent, we're looking for a lease and rent vouchers. Um, checks cut to landlords or property managers. So we look at both sides of it. And the third component of this uh, cocktail of, of compliance is the administrative piece. And this really is, do you have some good policies and procedures? So in addition to having policies and procedures, we want you to take these three critical components and not only put them into your planning efforts, but your practice efforts. So practice, policy, procedure, and planning all go together. Um, and what we're looking for is, did you follow our rules as well as your own rules? So if you've established a protocol for, say, coordinated entry as an access point to your programs, what we're going to ask you for is to show us that. How did you follow your coordinated entry? Was it consistent with your protocols at the continuum? Um, and across your grantees, your, your, uh, your own internal rules. So, and how is all of it, again, documented? So documentation, you'll hear us say, that's the path to HUD heaven here of getting a good monitoring. Next slide, please. When those three components all come together, you've got a refreshing monitoring. You can sit on the porch and take a sip of tea and, um, that should be the perfect monitoring, right? You've got those three components. And important in all of that is that the people who oversee those components of your programming come together to coordinate. So very frequently when we're out monitoring, it's often that the program people know what they're doing, the finance people know what they're doing, the administrative people know what they're doing, but they all sometimes don't know what each other are doing. And that's particularly true in larger organizations where you might not have that chance to coordinate very often. So we encourage you to do that uh, throughout the year, but certainly prior to monitoring so that you can do it. And just a sort of tip here, and many times monitorings are what we consider technical issues. We're always looking for fraud, waste, and abuse. We are public trust officers. We want to make sure your tax dollars are well invested, but most problems have a solution. And so when we cite a finding, oftentimes it's, it's non-compliance, but it's of a technical nature. Mandy showed you all the exhibits. Many of those problems can be fixed. So we include corrective action, as Mandy stated earlier, and we're pretty prescriptive. We, we want to help you get to the right answer. And so that often is your policies and procedures. So next slide, please. One of the things that we wanted to make sure is you should know what we're looking for when we come out. So these policies and procedures should reflect those three categories that I spoke to, um, but they also should look at the bigger picture. So in this case, is your consolidated plan and action plan been updated, especially for the CARES Act? Have you put these amendments in and kept them up to date? Uh, many folks now, two years into the pandemic are switching gears making amendments, is that adequately documented in IDIS? And have you adequately notified the public of the changes you intend to make, um, given the public a chance to engage in those changes? And we're gonna ask for that sometimes. We, ask, you know, we don't look at everything all the time, but we do look at citizen participation. And so again, document what your, show your work, show, tell us what you did. Um, 
they should cover activity management, right? These are the who, what, when, where, how, who does intake, who keeps the um, quality control over record keeping, who updates IDIS or SAGE, um, who's linking to I, uh, HMIS information, who follows up on a housing plan. Is that activity management um, procedures outlined in the policies as well for you? And certainly financial management. So we require that everyone has a financial management written policy and procedure. It should be consistent with part two, two part 200 um, so that you're uh, up to date on all the federal requirements as well as any state and local requirements that your funding uh, stream may include. We're gonna spend some more time on subrecipient management because we know that's a key topic. Many of you are communities that have been uh, awarded these funds and are collaborating with nonprofit partners in your community. Those nonprofit partners who deliver the activity um, on the street, they're the ones opening their doors to homeless and at risk clients. Those are your subrecipients, and you have to make sure that they are implementing these programs and they also have policies and procedures that they are following. So, how you monitor them, we're going to talk about a little bit later, but you should have oversight planning as part of how you're going to manage that. Who's in charge of it? Who reviews the vouchers and looks at the quarterly reports or monthly reports that you get in from them? Then certainly you should have folded into your policies and procedures all of the ESG CV specific requirements. So there are some additional levels of information that need to be tracked, including duplication of benefits and tie back to COVID. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about all of those things and answer your questions about them, but they should be part of your guidance documents. And then of course, any local considerations that your community, um, your city, county or state, your continuum of care, what the coordinated entry process is, that should all be incorporated into policies and procedures so that the rules of the game are understood by all the players. Next slide, please. Some additional critical elements I nodded to already, and that is the duplication of benefits. Uh, how are you gonna document that? Most folks are looking at the sources and uses for the program, right? This is at the program level, um, as well as at the client level. We wanna make sure that if clients got rent from the ERAP, the treasury program for ERAP, that you're not paying for the same months of rent through any ESG funds, or for that matter, CDBGCV funds. So you're looking at those sources and uses at a programmatic level, and in some cases for direct benefit to a, a client level as well. Um, the waivers that you may, the program flexibilities that HUD has put forth in developing these programs, make sure that you've notified HUD you're going to use them and track them. So they should be in your files. Uh, especially for some of the things that are client file driven, um, inspections and uh, disability documentation, some of those COC issues as well. So the, what we're saying in all of this is true for all the programs generally, whether you're using CDBG CV, ESG CV, any of the flexibilities for continuum of care, policies and procedures are kind of universal across all the different programs. But we cover reporting, we want to make sure that you are tracking expenses as you go through this. I'm sure you're all keenly aware that March 31st is our next spending milestone uh, that we HUD hopes that everyone will have 80% of their ESG CV grant expended by March 31st with 100% on that September 30th deadline. So we want you all to keep your eye on the calendar, adjust your policies um, as needed to change programming. Maybe you need to uh, make a, an amendment to your ESG program to move money around to ch accommodate changes that have happened during the pandemic and changes in use of funding. So all of that should be part of following uh, your policies, but also just good, good grants management on your part. And then, you know, COVID sort of rolled across the country at different stages. HUD has established January 21st, 2020 as the first documented case. That's when we allow expenses to go back to, but you should have that information in your county if it's different than that. 
if you know COVID, you didn't start these programs until three months later when COVID was present in your community and a public health uh, emergency was declared. Just having a sense of when that happened in your community and when you started these programs. So next slide, please. Again, some more of these um, specifics related to the program we talked about, but are these programs consistent with what your, your local design program design dictates? And that is often driven by the continuum of care. So while these funds have been awarded to units of government, it is very frequently a continuum of care that has helped guide what the needs are, the program design, and then the actual implementation. So that coordination should be documented and uh, consistent across the board of who's implementing it. Always, we talk about cost eligibility. So if you've been investing your resources, um, say to modify shelters during the pandemic, you want to make sure those costs that you've incurred are eligible, consistent with the notice that was introduced and consistent with Part 200 for any financial transactions that were made. Um, a lot of these we've already talked about, but how you implemented the programs should could be your implementation should be consistent with your um, policies and procedures. And that's what I said earlier about planning and practice are part of policies and procedures. So that practice part should, should match up. And that would include everything from inspecting the shelters, ensuring that you have leases in place between tenants and landlords with, that are legal leases. Um, we know that a big part of the ESGCV um, planning has been um, maybe disrupted by the um, eviction moratorium and certainly been able to keep your clients housed longer as a result, but that you know you are documenting eligibility consistent with what all the other um, events in the community were, including that eviction moratorium. And a big item that we look for, especially when we're doing a financial component of monitoring, is staff time. So if you are charging payroll to any of these grants, and many people do, you want to ensure that the appropriate amount of time was charged particularly when someone's not 100% charged to a grant, if a portion of their salary is charged, that you have a means of tracking time. So payroll records, time sheets, um, desk studies to look at time audits, however your organization does that and requires it, it should be consistent with Part 200 and you should have a documented case. Again, we're gonna be looking for the paper on it. So make sure you have that. And key here is that ESGCV and regular CV are two separate grants, so they should be separate in your accounting records as well. You should be able to document the costs for each one and show those transactions separately. Next slide, please. So why the policies and procedures? Mandy mentioned the cause when we write a monitoring report. It is a key find, a common finding that the cause was there weren't adequate policies and procedures to govern that particular um, inconsistency with the rules or non-compliant item. And the key is, here is fixing it, right? So the corrective action is make it right, update your policies and procedures if necessary, um, do that, but certainly prevent it again. Maybe you had a policy and procedure, but you didn't follow it, right? It's a pandemic, things went off the rails, you hired new staff, you lost staff, um, and so folks just weren't aware. So what we would send, say there is don't let it happen again. So find some way to incorporate this so that it becomes part of new staff training, that when you're hiring new staff, they are going to know these policies and be able to implement accordingly. So next slide, please. We're going to stop and take a moment. I know there's lots of questions flying in. So before we move on to what we see as our top 10 monitoring findings that we are anticipating with ESGCV, uh, Mark, are there some questions coming in that you want to pluck out that we might be able to answer for folks here? Sure, thanks. So um, hopefully people are seeing in the Q&A um, on the website 
the questions that are coming in, we move them at, we're trying to provide answers to them as they come in. Um, so, um, the, uh, some of them are about like, is the content's going to be made available? Yes, it would mean to be made available. So the responses are in there. Uh, I don't know, do we want to maybe, do you want me to highlight a couple of them to just discuss in you know, audibly with the group? Or, or would you prefer to just have them be answered in the portal? Are there a couple common ones, Mark, that maybe we could just take a break here and point out? Okay. Yeah, just maybe one or two of the, the sure. ones that we'll Let me echo, I'll echo one that showed up a couple times in different, different ways uh, regarding um, how a grantee, an ESG CV grant recipient would know who their uh, ESG CV rep uh, representative is. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to respond to that one. So each field office has a team of reps that work with the different communities. So your local field office uh, rep would be your first person to go to. And then we are partner, the field offices are partnering with headquarters for the CV program where we've hired a team of folks to help out because this is such a big program. So there's also a CV rep, an ESG CV rep assigned for each community. So if you start with your local field office, the folks you're most familiar with, they can collaborate with your CV specific rep as well. I don't know, Marlisa, if you wanna add any meat to that. Yeah, I think the best way is to reach out to your CPD uh, field office rep and they can make sure that they provide any contact information if you haven't been in touch with them directly. Okay, uh, another couple questions that have come up are related to the expenditure deadlines. Uh, and so I think I could probably present and answer these ones based on, I'll just kind of echo the responses that are on the system. and. Uh, regarding the upcoming 80% and 100% expenditure uh, deadlines, uh, both those are currently the deadlines. There may, it's possible there could be additional guidance or, or um, information coming on those. That would be coming soon. But for right now, those are still the established deadlines. Um, and... And encourage everyone to do is look at their budget. Where are you? Monitor this on a weekly basis. And if you need to pivot to reallocate funds, um, think about that September 30th deadline, right? So if you have a bigger project and you need to get it underway, you might not have it finished by March 31st, but you should be in constant communication to let us know that. So have a spending plan if, if you're going to pivot uh, because we want to help you get there. And then there was a couple questions. I just, I'll highlight one more here that sort of captures a few of the submitted questions related to uh, findings that may be issued off of ESG CV programs. Um, one being, could it involve repayment of funds? Uh, and the short answer to that is yes, it could involve repayment of funds. That would be detailed um, in, the, in the, the, the language of the finding in the monitoring report, if there was a repayment of funds uh, that was being part of the corrective action. Uh, and then, Another one related to if the findings um, could be retroactively applied if the program has already ended. And the answer to that is also yes, they could be. Um, it'd be very specific to the program that's being monitored and the finding being issued. Um, but in some cases, there might be a link between what the ESG CV and then the normal ESG program is doing. So uh, the finding might be made off of a review of an ESG CV uh, component or, or document but it may have a, a more, a, a wider application to the whole ESG program. Um, so yes, it's possible that we may do a monitoring, HUD may do a monitoring of an ESG CV program and issue findings uh, even after the program has technically spent, the, spent its money down uh, and finished. And anyone can jump in, um, Marlisa or Tammy, if, if, you, if you want any added clarity on that as well. I noted a number of questions, Mark, around pay. We talked about documenting time during your policies and procedures and how you will track time. And the ESG CV program has allowed for hazard pay, um, some stipends for folks that may be working in your program, those kinds of things. Always time should be tracked, right? So those are eligible expenses and any eligible expense should be documented. 
have source documentation. And for us, that would be a payroll sheet. If there is a hazard pay um, allocation, what do your policies and procedures say about how that will be determined? Is it based on hours worked? Is it based on the position? Which again, the rationale for how you're determining these things and documenting it. Should we move to our top 10 list now? And we're gonna come back to some of these questions at the end too. Yeah, I think that that'd be good. And, and we'll, we'll continue to, at our group here, we'll continue to provide responses to the questions on the website. And I think we're gonna revisit the Q&A again at the end. So um, continue to submit questions uh, and we will continue to, uh, to consolidate them onto the list and then provide responses as, as we're able. Okay. Marlisa, you wanna kick off the top 10? Marley, so you're on mute. Got I'm it. muted. I was looking for the mute button. I knew it was somewhere. Okay. Thanks for bearing with me, folks. Next slide, please. So this is our chance to sort of prep you, prep you all based on prior monitorings for what we expect may be uh, places where there may be um, well, we're just encouraging you all to take a close look at these top 10 areas to avoid any potential um, issues during monitoring. Um, and not to say that uh, necessarily the, there will be findings in these areas, but um, these are probably the more challenging areas. And we know that we're getting a lot of questions about them. And in these ways, ESG CV is a little bit different from ESG. So we're honing in on those nuances and trying to give you um, a hint, some hints as to where you could probably pay more attention, give these areas a little bit more love and care in um, doing your monitoring preparations. So here's a, a list and we're gonna go through each one uh, individually. Next slide, please. Client eligibility and documentation. So this is, uh, this is uh, definitely a cornerstone of each monitoring visit. So you should be paying particular attention to uh, ensuring that your documentation establishes HOMA status, that clients are meeting eligibility categories one through four, that you're um, showing that the um, each client status is documented according to um, each particular component type or activity type that you are funding. So for homeless, homelessness prevention, they're, they're meeting um, homeless category two, three, or four. Um, in addition, the annual income verification for very low income, what, that's what is uh, in place for ESG CV. Um, also making sure that uh, you're documenting, closely documenting eligibility during eviction moratoria. So whether that's the local eviction moratorium, um, a local eviction moratorium may be put in place by your state or the federal eviction moratorium. So we know that um, if you are using homelessness prevention eligibility that would be sort of um, affected or impacted by an eviction moratorium, we're, we're gonna be paying close um, attention to that to make sure that people are eligible if they otherwise would be covered by an eviction moratorium. So we have uh, some materials available on that of eligibility during eviction moratoria. And um, we can post those in the chat if, and then you should take a look at those, make sure that you're in, you're consistent um, and documentation is showing um, that you're in compliance that way. When it comes to the homeless definition under paragraph one, three, little three, make sure that you're aware of the waiver that changes the definition where 90 days in an, in an institution has increased to 120 days. So you have a little bit more freedom, more flexibility. So if someone has a stay in an institution, in an institution over 90 days, but less than 120 days, they would still meet the criteria for uh, that homeless definition in paragraph um, one, little three. So if you wanna get a head start on this, the exhibit 28-1 is a really good place to start 
that is the current one for ESG, the ESG program, and it prompts you for looking at the documentation necessary to establish that your program participants have met the applicable homeless or at-risk um, eligibility requirements, depending on whether you're serving someone in shelter versus rapid rehousing versus prevention or um, street outreach. Next slide, please. So this, um, this is a handy cheat sheet that's also available on the HUD exchange, and it goes through the criteria of the homeless definition. So um, category one, literal homelessness, and it goes, it, this is pretty much exactly from the regulations, and it parses it out by category. It's a really easy way to ensure that you're following along with the um, the regulations in a in a very user friendly way, especially if you're um, if you're more visually if you're more of a visual learner, this this is a great resource to um, take you through category one through run through four um, with with each criterion right there in front of you. Next slide, please. And then the accompanying record keeping requirements. So. It takes you through each category and what kind of documentation should be in case files um, for each, um, each homeless, homeless definition category. So this can be kind of confusing, I think, for a lot of folks. So um, just having all of the categories here in front of you with very like overarching detail also taken from the record keeping requirements in the regs, that's 24 CFR 576.500. Um, that can really help you make sure that you're on the right track. And so um, again, just circling back to homelessness prevention, which I think probably gives um, people the most heartburn, the most uh, challenge in making sure that you've got the right doc documentation. When you're looking at category two, the imminent risk of homelessness, which is typically um, the category that's used a lot of the time under the homeless definition for homelessness prevention, you can also loop in some of those other materials that I was talking about. The um, well, it's uh, eligibility under the homelessness prevention component, and we can include a link. So, so just so that you're ironing out what paperwork you should have in your case files, especially to show that yes, even though an eviction moratorium was in place, you this um, per, this program participant still um, qualifies for homelessness prevention. Next slide, please. And then uh, duplication of benefits. This is another area where we get a lot of questions and we know that you all um, are definitely concerned about being monitored in this area. Um, but to be, to be really honest and break it down, um, duplication of benefits is not a whole lot different from um, ensuring that you're not paying for the same cost twice. So I think that the, um, the heart of the matter is just making sure that you have the right documentation to show that. And um, when it comes to ESG CV um, activity types, it's really an issue on the most part for rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention. Um, you, we, you know, you, we know that you have FEMA costs for um, temporary emergency shelter, non-congregate shelter that's also in the mix. Also be aware of the emergency rental assistance program, as well as state and local funding. As long as you're able to establish that costs have been paid, that have been paid for with ESGCV have not also been paid for with other COC funding or CDBGCV funding. Um, you, if you have the policies and procedures in, in place, um, your internal documentation is showing that you've been compliant with your internal policies and, pr and procedures. You should, um, you should be in good shape. So um, there is a really helpful CDBG CV duplication of benefits quick guide. That is um, a really helpful resource to use to make sure that your policies and procedures are um, in line with that. And um, that's a place that you can turn to right now uh, to make sure that you, um, you're in the you're on the right track in anticipation for a monitoring. Next slide, please. And the preventing, preparing for, and responding to tieback. 
we've said in a number of different venues, what type of the level of documentation that we expect to see for that PPR, as we call it, tie back to ESG CV, um, it's at the system level. So for each component at the um, component type level, um, we would expect to see how you're using your rapid rehousing program overall, your homelessness prevention program overall, um, shelter and admin to, to prepare, prevent, or respond to coronavirus. So we're not looking for individual case file notes showing that a household, the assistance provided to a household is being provided. Um, you don't need to show that they've tested positive for COVID or that they've lost income due to COVID. Um, this is at a very high, a high community system-wide level, such as we are rehabbing our shelter, we're making, we're replacing our shelter roof to make sure that our doors stay open. Um, we're doing shelter rehab or we're um, investing a lot of ESG CV money for PPE and um, other shelter uh, renovation projects to make sure that we're social distancing or, or funding other um, venues to provide shelter so that we can socially distance and keep our, our um, the numbers lower in each individual shelter facility. So this resource that we link to here, ESG CV Prevent, Prepare, and Respond Tieback is a really, really useful guide. And I highly suggest you referring to it um, to take a look at whether or not you are um, you have the sufficient documentation in place for P for PPR, and something that you can do right now is just ensure that your ESG um, activity types in IDIS has the appropriate sort of language in there to show how you are responding to COVID with your um, ESG CV funds, and also. Um, what you may have forgotten to do is uh, make sure that your documentation for annual ESG for COVID response is also addressed in your ESG um, activity types. So this resource tells you how to do that. It also flags when an amendment may be necessary if you decide to use your annual ESG CV or your annual funds for COVID response. So um, to prepare uh, for keep monitoring on the PPR tieback, really make sure you take a look at that guide. Next slide. Now I think I'm turning it over to you, Jill, right? Or is it Mandy? It's me. Thank you so much, Marlisa. Um, okay, so number four on our top 10 list is implementation of ESG CV waivers and alternative flexibility. So I think this is something that's been baked into other discussions that we've been having this afternoon and was something that was definitely baked into the conversation Jill was having around policies and procedures. But we just wanted to highlight it on our top 10 list because we realized that this was a challenge. So this ESG CV, the, the allocations were made and then the notices came out. And amidst all of the complicated circumstances you were navigating, you were trying to navigate program implementation. So we get that. Um, so this is just a plug for the fact that, you know, what was in the notices, the waivers and the alternative requirements and the flexibilities, anything that you were taking advantage of needed to be incorporated into your written standards, your policies and procedures. Um, at the program level. So your, your standard operating procedures for how you're running your programs, what you're going to pay for, um, you know, what's permissible, what eligible, you know, your eligible activities, how you're going to do certain things. And some of you might have established separate emer like emergency standard operating procedures that were really just kind of off the shelf versions of what would be used during this time. And maybe some of you incorporated them into your policies and procedures in other ways. Either way is fine, um, but there should be a reflection of the ESG CV, you know, what's in the ESG CV notices, the alternative requirements, the waivers, the flexibilities at the program level. And then they should also be, as well as being in your intake procedures, we would also be looking for all of those things at the client level. So when we pick up a client file, uh, we're sampling an, a couple of your client files, looking to see um, if they're in order, 
we're going to see stuff that specifically speaks to ESG CV requirements. So, you know, homeless status verification, of course, would be in there. Anything else that relates to that, uh, such as the prevention eligibility that Marlisa was talking about and like moratoriums and documentation of, of the prevention status, that would be there. That there's no duplication of benefits at the client level, that would be in the file. Your rent reasonableness analysis in light of the fact that the fair market rent requirement is waived and it's replaced with rent reasonableness, we'd want to see that analysis at the client level. Um, how you've met habitability, um, like your, ins your inspections, basically. Um, for prevention, also looking at 50% AMI and then really like the term of the rental assistance through you giving, providing that assistance for the appropriate amount of time. So looking for it at the program level, looking for it at the client level, which would be in your intake procedures as well as in the individual files. Next slide, please. So this is tricky, surely, for everyone. Um, having a new funding stream and figuring out how it, uh, how to keep track of things. And so this is, we're still on number four, implementation of the waivers and the requirements. So the flexibilities and the alternative requirements, um, actually, Marlisa just segued this, is that they can apply to both ESG CV and annual ESG if used for COVID, prepare, prevent, respond. What when you, you're not able to apply the flexibility as an alternative requirements, if you're just using your annual ESG and it doesn't have that COVID prepare, prevent, respond uh, tie back. So you do need to be tracking your funding sources separately, both your ESG CV and your annual ESG, ESG, both what is used for COVID and what is not used for COVID needs to be tracked separately. And that's because there's different requirements that apply to the different funding streams. So there's a little chart here that just highlights a few of the differences, and you'll see that ESG CV and annual ESG C and annual ESG used for COVID, they're in the same column because you know match is waived for both, the admin cap is 10% for both, and the emergency shelter and street outreach cap is waived for both. But for your annual ESG that's not used for COVID response, you know, your match still applies, the admin cap is seven and a half percent, and you have that limit, that cap on emergency shelter and street outreach. So we're going to be looking for the method by which you're tracking what, where your funding streams are going and um, whether or not you're meeting the corresponding requirements. Next slide, please. And we're still under number four, um, but we wanted to put a plug in for one great resource that will co be coming your way soon. Um, and this is a good way to help you navigate the client case file part of compliance um, as it pertains to the alternative requirements and flexibilities. So uh, this is the Rapid Rehousing and Homelessness Prevention Case File Toolkit. And there's going to be a lot of great like checklists and review forms and samples in here to help you navigate what uh, getting your case files in order. Hopefully they're already in order, but this will be coming soon and definitely we'll make sure that um, there's a good um, announcement about the availability of this toolkit. Next slide, please. Okay. All right, number five on our top 10 list, documentation relative to the new eligible activities and new eligible costs that were rolled out as part of ESG CV. So there was tons of stuff in the notice, both of the notices, um, allowing for additional activities and additional costs. So there's lots of examples. Um, and we're going to just go through and highlight a couple of them as teasers. Uh, but really, the key here is making sure that these eligible activities, eligible costs, are incorporated into your policies and procedures. And then, they're, if, if applicable, they're also incorporated into the subrecipient agreement. So if you're going to let your subrecipient pay for certain new activities, new costs, you want to see that in the subrecipient agreement, want to see it reflected in the budget and that sort of thing. So what are we talking about here when we say new activities, new costs, uh, lots of stuff? Um, and some of this kind of came up in the Q&A, so I think you are already uh, ahead of us in this respect. But some examples. 
So the notice um, speaks to temporary emergency shelter um, and some of what needs to be in the files. If you are taking advantage of ESG for temporary emergency shelter, you would need that verification from your public health officials that it's necessary, uh, the need, the use, the term of those shelters um, and the reasonable cost analysis to support the shelter. For hazard pay, which was one of the questions in our Q&A break, um, it's permissible and we would want to see how this is defined and how this is implemented in your personnel policies and procedures um, to make sure that it's, you know, reasonable and appropriate. And Jill spoke to that um, and also that it's being provided to, you know, the appropriate staff. And that means like the direct service providers of your organization. So this would be something where as you're tracking it, you're also you also have a policy who gets it under what circumstances, how much, that sort of thing we'd be looking. If you took advantage of this activity, we'd be look, looking for a corresponding policy and procedure as well as tracking um, for the, the personal costs. Landlord incentives, something made eligible under ESGCV and um, certain things we would wanna see at the client file level, we would wanna make sure that any client landlord incentives that were provided did not exceed three times the rent charged for the unit. Um, and that the type of incentive that was provided was permissible and that you also have a policy and procedure about what types of landlord incentives you will provide. Um, and I think one of the things that is important to think about and this landlord incentives example really, um, I think is a good example, is that policies and procedures are also about, also about transparency and fairness. So establishing a policy about what type of landlord incentive you will provide a landlord means that every landlord is being treated consistently and fairly, and there's no question about like unduly um, you know, enhancing one landlord over the other. So that's why part of the reason why it's so important to get this stuff into your policies and procedures, just that transparency, fairness, equal treatment, all of that. Um, landlord, ins oh, I'm sorry, volunteer incentives are eligible. It just need to be reasonable and necessary. And again, they'd be defined in your policies and procedures. And next slide, please. Um, the list goes on. So a couple more examples. If you are paying for vaccine incentives, um, we'd be looking to make sure that the, you know, the payments made don't ex exceed $50 per dose per person. Um, and you should have documentation in your program files that there are no other duplicative incentives that are available and accessible to homeless uh, folks in your community. Cell phones and internet, eligible cost, um, but needs to be tied to a stay-at-home order, or like a necessary virtual activity that the participant needs to stay in, engaged in. Um, and there needs to be a process for tracking. If you're providing cell phones, it's the property of you, the grantee. So we would want to see what your process is for tracking and retrieving those phones from clients. For personal protective equipment, eligible, um, and your policies and procedures should address what types of equipment you are purchasing and um, what clients and staff uh, you can purchase that equipment for. Renter's insurance is eligible, um, but only if it's a requirement of the landlord. So you would want something in the file that demonstrates that it is a requirement of the landlord, and maybe that's the lease. Um, maybe, maybe that's a requirement um, as stipulated by the lease, so that would be good. And that, if that's in the client file, that would be um, a good evidence of compliance in this area. And then for furniture, um, again, property of the recipient, you the grantee, so we would be looking for your process for retrieving that and um, the disposition disposition requirements um, incorporated into your policies and procedures as well. So these are just some examples of the sorts of things we would be looking for. If we were coming out, um, we would be seeing whether or not you're taking advantage of a flexibility. And then we would look to see is that flexibility addressed in your policies and procedures, and if applicable, is there documentation in the client file as it relates to the particular client. Next slide. Wonderful. And with that, I will turn it over to Jill. Thanks, Mandy. I think you can uh, gather our, our thinking here on our top 10 list by now. We, we 
generally have focused on things that are new. You know, you all have a lot of expertise already in the ESG program, but there are all these new components to ESG CV. And we also added in the normal sort of everyday common findings that we see anyway. So when we develop this top 10 list of likely pitfalls, we're using our experiences of having done a lot of ESG monitoring over the years and all of the new components that have been tricky that you've been juggling in the midst of working during a pandemic, serving people in new ways, handling lots of extra resources. So that's where this list comes from. Um, we have covered many of them in the presentation earlier. And I think if you had to take a sip of that iced tea that we uh, showed earlier for every time we said policy and procedure and documentation, we'd need to take a break now for everyone to get up um, because you can imagine those are the things that we wanna make sure you have in place, good documentation and good policies and procedures. So number six on our top 10 list is financial management. And this is generally because we always see, you know, errors in compliance here where this gets tricky for organizations. Um, so we're going to cover a couple of the key points that we want to make sure you have uh, ready for us when we come out to monitor. And that is, how's your budget look? Did you spend the money where you said you were going to spend the money on? And you gave us a budget in your amendment within the uh, annual action plan of how this money was going to go. And so we're gonna look back to that. It should be consistent with the agreements that you put in place with your community partners or subrecipients, and they all should have line item specific budgets that has a scope of work um, for those line items. And that's what we're going to look to to see how the dollars flowed from there. Are all your costs eligible and supported? It's probably one of our top financial findings is that we see expenditures that didn't have supporting vouchers or invoices. So be sure you have good cost documentation. Um, and a key in that that we already talked about was staff time. So especially given that you have maybe uh, some bumps for folks that have been working like the hazard pay or in any incentives, how you documented that and that you show it. Um, Again, we talked about separating this in your chart of accounts that you have ESG and ESG CV accounted for separately. We know folks are uh, braiding resources in many of these programs, but it sh still should be accounted for separately. So your accounting records should in fact separate those funds and account for them um, accordingly. And we just wanted to point out, this is more of a, a pro tip here. Um, not an area that um, we see as a pitfall, but one we see as a perk for you. And that is use of the CDBG monitoring handbook that we have spoken about. Exhibit 34.1 in, in particular, 34.1a is the financial management piece that we look at most frequently when we come out. There's some additional ones for procurement and for cost allowability. They are also in that 34, chapter 34, but this is pretty universal. Um, and so I would encourage the program and finance folks to work together to look through this exhibit. It largely addresses your systems, your accounting systems, your internal controls, um, separation of duties, your um, how you treat record keeping, all of that. And so this is a really good tool for you to just do a wellness check in your organization, whether you're getting monitored this year or not, just something that on a regular basis, you wanna take a look at and make sure your systems are up to date. Next slide, please. We've got a few more financial management um, tips for you. Um, I feel like the policies and procedures queen today, which is, um, <laughs> we keep adding more in, but these are very common pitfalls. We frequently see folks who either in their policies and procedures and, and equally in their subrecipient agreements use the wrong citation. So if you are looking at your agreements and they say part 85 or part 84, anywhere in there, then you, uh, you're already going to get a corrective action to update those to today's standards. So get hip and follow part 200 as opposed to 84 and 85. Um, the other uh, one that we wanted to touch on directly was administrative costs. So there are indirect and direct 
costs. They do have a cap. You all know that there was, you know, traditionally the seven and a half percent for ESG. Um, and you should know what, what you've allocated and spent for your admin. It should be documented as well. A lot of times this is kind of a general catch-all for communities and they just call everything admin uh, that wasn't a direct program. But it also should, you should have an admin budget that has sources and uses and be able to track them back to those grants. Um, we talked already about having a good internal controls as part of your policies um, and having a good understanding of who does what in the organization to ensure that you do have a good separation of duties. A couple other key things. One is um, that I'm gonna hit on, you can read the slide, but the two ones we see a lot um, and often have to cite a finding on are single audits and how you procured it. Many times folks get a good audit uh, bid and they stick with that auditor for years and don't go back out to procure those services on a regular basis. So I know in our office, we advise grantees to do this every three years at minimum, and you should be following the OMB standards of how to procure an audit to make sure it's consistent with federal uh, guidelines and across all federal funds, not just HUD, right? Many of you get lots of other federal funds. So these audit standards are consistent across all the different federal sources. So um, procure your audit, file your audit. This is done electronically. Uh, when you have a single audit, it is done through the Federal Audit Clearinghouse so that we have access to it. Make sure it's filed on time. If there are findings in your audit, uh, we review them and follow up with you, especially if they are related to HUD funding or any kind of overall management. Uh, so do that. You have, if there's a financial analyst in your field office assigned to your grantee, they will be following up with you to help address any audit findings that you might have. Um, and then lastly, the debarment. Um, very frequently, we see that per, um, grantees not checking the debarment list for any contractors or consultants that they might be engaging as part of their program. So if you're hiring out contractors or uh, consultants, you want to check that against the suspended and debarment list. You can do that um, through the federal website that we've included and show us. Again, documentation, always the key to it during monitoring. So next slide, please, for number seven. And these are the housing requirements. Mandy touched on these a bit earlier as part of the waiver, but you know there were a lot of new flexibilities put in place during the pandemic, and especially with the ESG CV money that allowed you to approach your work differently related to housing. Uh, you know, we allowed you to do remote inspections um, or delay inspections until it was safe to enter our property. But you still should have documentation. We want to make sure that clients that are federally subsidized are living in safe conditions. So we want to make sure that habitability is in fact documented or HQS, depending on the program standard that you're using. So how did you do it? What evidence do you have that there was either a, a remote monitoring or that you went on site and it was documented? Um, the rent reasonableness test, because there was a waiver here and that you could, we know the housing market's been tight, so you may have had to exceed fair market rent. How do you document the comparables? This is a common finding normally, um, and we suspect even more challenging during the last two years uh, while you've been handling more clients in different ways. So make sure you have these housing requirements, to, um, the, the rent reasonableness comparables in your file so that you can show whoever comes out to monitor or you have to send them in. And the last is an environmental review, right? This is one of those other duties as assigned. People frequently in the homeless programs forget about this part. I know our CDBG and home folks are hammer it a lot more, but you did your program need to have an environmental review? It should be part of your overall program to look at this, to make sure if a request for release of funds was needed, particularly uh, for larger maybe construction projects where you would have needed to do that, that you submitted those to HUD, that you had adequate public notification, um, and that you will be able to evidence that for any review. 
very frequently. We have a separate uh, regional environmental team across the country that works with the field offices who does a standalone environmental monitoring sometimes or a you know, side by side with the program to look at environmental. So make sure you have those things. Um, the exempt does not mean exempt for paperwork. You have to make a determination that the project was exempt or categorically excluded. So make sure that your, your environmental review records demonstrate the determination that was made and why. And if you have questions about this, we know it's something that many of the, especially the ESG uh, subrecipients might not be familiar with please call your HUD rep. We'd be happy to help you work through what you need to have to do this. And, and if you didn't, you know how to remedy it. Next slide, please. The, the number eight uh, item that we included is record keeping, because if we didn't say documentation of all of this enough during this presentation, uh, we aren't gonna get our ha hazard pay today. Um, so as good bureaucrats, we have to make sure we, we include a, a record keeping component to every presentation, but you really do need to document. That's that's the entire basis for how we get to judge your good work during a monitoring. Uh, if we can't find the paper on it or you can't describe it to us and tell us, show us what you did, we unfortunately can't evidence it. So remember when we're monitoring, we're always looking backwards. Um, it's historical and evidentiary. So we we you can tell us what you're going to do, but we can only judge monitoring. It's a compliance exercise on what you've actually done. So having good records is key to showing your success. And um, again, these are these are the key points we think that could trip folks up and that we encourage you to do a wellness check on your program to ensure that you have them in place. Um, again, we included a tool here, and that is a link to the ESG um, monitoring handbook. Again, and some updates are coming for CV, but they're, they're, these standard ESG ones will be very informative for you as you do your internal checks and prepare for monitoring. So next to number nine, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Mark, and uh, he's going to be the home stretch here in our top 10 list. Thanks, Jill. Uh, working our way through the top 10, almost through it here. Uh, Lead-based paint requirements is actually a somewhat quicker, easier one to cover, I guess, because there haven't really been any changes to the lead-based paint requirements. Um, you know, we have had a lot of COVID-related waivers, program waivers, regulatory waivers. Um, outside of HQS, which has a tangential, housing quality standards has a tangential relationship to lead-based paint inspections. Uh, there's not really uh, any changes. So all the lead-based paint requirements are still in effect. Uh, there were no waivers uh, related to those during the pandemic. Um, so how that breaks down for your program in ESG uh, and ESG CV is um, that you're still required uh, to oversee and ensure lead disclosure for any uh, properties that are being rented or leased using ESG funding or ESG CV funding. Um, and that would be any pre-1978 properties. Uh, and then you'd have to um, ensure you're following the lead safe housing rule. Uh, if you are providing more than 100 days of rental assistance using ESG or ESG CV uh, funding. Um, and so uh, just to really quickly cover that 100 days of rental assistance, because this came up earlier was um, that's continuous days of assistance. So if you are providing um, one month of assistance to a client, and then you wait three or four months later, and they come back and they need another month of assistance. Um, so let's say it's four months later, so it's more than 100 days. Uh, that would have triggered that lead safe housing rule. So something to be aware of. Um, and that's why a lot of the programs tend to limit uh, rental assistance to three, to three months so that they don't exceed that 100 days of continuous assistance. Um, and uh, one other note on the inspections, I had mentioned there was a waiver, a program waiver for housing quality standards inspections could be done remotely or virtually. Uh, that did not occur for the lead-based paint inspections, which is a more rigorous inspection of all painted surfaces in a property. So um, just a reminder that all those lead-based paint re requirements are still in effect. Uh, if you have you know, more specific questions on that, we can follow up in the Q&A or you can contact your local rep for additional info on that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the last one of the top 10, um, and this kind of 
is a, a recapitulation of some stuff that we had previously talked about is uh, subrecipient written agreements, the importance of, of having those and, and keeping them updated and making sure that they reflect um, whatever requirements that you want to make sure are being followed within the program. Uh, so um, if you have subrecipient written agreements that you previously used with ESG, with normal ESG subrecipients, you may want to take a look at those to make sure that you're uh, incorporating any sort of different requirements of ESG CV. So for instance, the, the COVID prepare, prevent, response tieback or a duplication of benefits analysis, um, the expenditure timelines, all these things can and should be incorporated into your subrecipient written agreements. That's the agreement that you're going to have with your subrecipient. And um, again, when our office does our monitoring, we're going to focus on the recipient. So the, the community that receives the funds. And we pass the subrecipient mon monitoring responsibilities on to you. And so um, those will be, that's your responsibility to oversee. And, and, and a subrecipient written agreement is the cornerstone of, of that whole monitoring that you're going to do. Um, so uh, again, some of the things I mentioned was uh, you could incorporate the the flex the, the waivers, the COVID ref flexibilities, waivers uh, related activities um, and protocols uh, within your subrecipient rent agreement. You'd also in, want to inclu include uh, reference to um, the expenditure deadlines. So uh, spending timelines, um, including some sort of review, uh, regular review of expenditure timeliness. Um, and also including in your subrecipient written agreements, um, any sort of conditions or, or um, actions that may trigger reprogramming um, or even a termination or something like that, you'd want to make sure that those are clear in your subrecipient written agreement. Um, and that could include conflict resolution. Um, you know, again, we, we often see that recipients and subrecipients have close and, and good re relationships, but um, that conflict resolution isn't isn't to, to cover the good relationships. It's when things go bad, and and if if our office on the HUD side gets involved, that's one of the things we're going to go to is the subrecipient written agreement and the conflict resolution um, process and, and termination process if that's something being discussed. So, um, making sure that that's sort of part of your subrecipient written agreements helps um, address these problems before they become serious problems, or even help with your ongoing monitoring and evaluation of your subrecipients. Uh, so next slide, we have one wrap up slide on the sort of top 10, um, just to, to kind of go back to some of the stuff we see more commonly in our monitoring of uh, this has been predominantly ESG programs because we haven't really started a full monitoring review of ESG CV yet. Um, but some of the stuff we saw in our uh, monitoring of ESG programs over the years, uh, documentation of homeless status. So whether it's incomplete uh, documentation, missing documentation, um, inadequate documentation. This, this is how you're classifying in, in, um, all your costs for the program. And so um, you know, we're often not able to go and talk to individuals or meet with the, the clients served. So we're going to look at those case files, that documentation um, that you have to ensure that the, the eligibility criteria has all been met, um, as well as cost. Any sort of program costs are going to need to include source documentation. Um, so uh, you know, that would be any general program expenditures, but some things to consider as well as a match. Um, so match, even if you're, you know, that's going to be non-federal source if it's match, but because you're using it as match on a federal program that requires the match, we, our, our, our program in our office will also review the documentation related to that match expenditure. Um, and that would, you know, include also you know, beyond match could include indirect cost, admin cost, any of your staff time. That go that you're billing towards the program again, either ESG funds or match funds. Uh, we would need to review uh, source documentation for those. So you're going to want to make sure you have that available. Uh, just a, a note here that a general ledger is 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 almost, you know, never going to be considered an adequate source documentation for um, program costs, whether they're admin staff time. Uh, you but you're going to want to make sure you have more clearly documented costs and currents and expenditure data. Um, one thing that uh, I believe it was Jill mentioned earlier was single audits uh, and how you procure your single audits uh, that they have to be procured even if they're not HUD funded uh, because again you're 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 complying with the HUD requirement that you complete a single audit so the compliance um, requirement includes uh, the procurement uh, associated procurement requirements and. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, one of the noted challenges we had, this isn't really a common finding per se, but uh, as we move into monitoring for 2021, uh, we completed a, as a program office, as CPD did, almost entirely remote monitorings in uh, 2020. And the plan for right now is, to, is that we will likely be starting out doing remote monitoring in 2021. Those could change given the conditions. It's, it's almost entirely COVID dependent at this point with, with case counts and, and, and things like that. So um, presuming we do the remote monitoring experiences again, uh, we used a uh, portal to a website that was built into Exchange documents, uh, which worked well for ex exchanging and sharing large files, case files, documents, things like that. Um, so our office would request grantee documentation through this um, website called the, the Grantee Document Exchange, which the acronym is GDX. And uh, that allowed, it's sort of like a Dropbox um, file share kind of uh, program. And that allows grantees to upload requested files and then it allows our office to associate those, those files with a particular monitoring exhibit and monitoring session. Um, so uh, one note on that is, is um, our office does not want to store anything that has uh, p personally identifiable information or PII, so things like social security numbers, um, health data, stuff like that. If there are certain elements of it that we would need, we'll let you know uh, in terms of uh, uh, ensuring uh, eligibility related to program compliance that we would let you know. Uh, but generally, you're going to want to redact that PII before you, you, know, you send it to us or you upload it into GDX. Um, and we don't have to go too deep into the document exchange side just because, again, if you're monitored, you're going to get a monitoring notification letter and then the local office or staff that's going to be doing the monitoring will reach out to coordinate uh, discussion about um, getting you set up in GDX and, and document exchange and what our expectations are going to be. Uh, so uh, next, I think next slide, and then we, I believe we uh, move on to a uh, review of preparing for monitoring, which will be done by uh, Ms. Tamara Thomas. I believe Tamara. Yeah, that's me. It's all right. Thanks, Mark. Sure. Good day, Emily. Uh, what powerful information we've been like cramming, right? Uh, but let's move forward and talk about how to prepare for monitoring. First, breathe, <laughs> okay? Um, think of it as you file your taxes and the IRS can come at any time to see proof of what you're filing. That's what we're responsible for. We have to be um, fiduciarily responsible for funds that we administer to you. So just like you're going to give your subrecipients money, you want to make sure they're doing what you're paying them to do because ultimately you're accountable. It's why we come as HUD reviewers to just review what we call monitoring. So let's not stress, but give you some quick tips. We're coming to the finish line. Next slide, please. When you prepare yourself, some things to consider is organization, the availability of your documentation. I think you've heard that as a common theme the number one monitoring finding we've had across any project is documentation. The evidence to support that it really happened, okay? So consider how you organize your documents so that not only would we come and monitor you, but let's say the OIG happens to come and monitor you, the Office of the Inspector General, or your wonderful IRS agent. You wanna be able to readily have that information available. So as referenced earlier, establishing your policies and procedures, how you're gonna do it, what steps it's gonna take, what staff you're gonna to pay to do these things. Make sure you have them in a central place. Regularly review your policies and procedures. We should not show up and find that you're missing a basic key element that you're getting money to provide a service to, right? Let me give you an example. If you have 50 wonderful chronically homeless individuals that you bought off the street and put in housing, we just wanna see evidence that that's what you did. So where can you get that information? Um, let's talk about how you can make sure that you do your own internal quality review. I love the word self-check, wellness check. Let's make sure we're healthy, just like you go when, when you go to the doctor, okay? Not only do you know where the documentation is, do you make sure that your policies and procedures are in place, 
but regularly ongoing, you're making sure that you're administering it. And I'm saying you, so that means the recipient and the subrecipient. The subrecipient who gets the money is just as responsible, right? Consider your client records, how they're maintained. Are they easily re readable? Is it legible? Is the documentation something that you can understand? Because again, we're just coming to see the evidence. Hopefully you've already seen it. Um, activities specific to the review will outline in our letter that has been said earlier, but are you ready for that? Let's say we need to do unit inspections and our physical inspector, inspectors arrive as part of the HUD monitoring review. Can you, have you already conducted unit inspections? And I know we're in a COVID atmosphere, so do you at least have your inspection paperwork ready? Okay, um, consider the capacity of the financial management team, right? As of 20, 2015, 2015, two CFR 200 requirements, the uniform administrative requirements went into effect with HUD, 2015. So that meant that any grant funds you received effective 2015 were ad applicable as was expressed earlier, okay? Um, I saw one of the questions in the q and I'm just gonna hit it really quickly. The part 8485 that was referenced earlier, that's old. So no, we're not gonna use those current exhibits. We are updating the current ESG exhibits. So as we go through the updates, we're gonna remove that equipment, procurement and financial management exhibit. So you won't even see that in chapter 28 shortly, okay? All right, so consider the capacity of your staff, what their documentation is like. If you know there's technical assistance you need, if you know there's areas that need to be strengthened, you catch them before anybody else does. And I can only reiterate what several folks have said already, your single audit. When we arrive, one of the first things we're gonna request is your policies and procedures and your single audit. And if you have 24 subrecipients and we randomly pick 10, we're going to request their single audits. So the question is, when did you last review your subrecipients' single audits? Many um, large localities, they make it part of the grant agreement process, especially if they're going to constantly receive money. Before you get the next wave of money, we want to see your, your single audit. If that's a practice that works for you, great. Look at other peer options, what folks around you in different localities are doing and see if maybe there's a process they're doing better. All right, next slide, let's keep going. In preparation, you wanna consider your subrecipients, right? Just as you're gonna be selected to be monitored, you're the one that signed the grant agreement with HUD, you are ultimately the one that's gonna get any findings or concerns and have to make sure the corrective actions take place. We'll, we will notify you in our letter which subrecipients we're gonna see. So those randomly selected 10, will be part of all the information we give you on the front end. When we call and say, hey, you've been selected, a letter is coming, we're gonna let you know. Or we'll ask for information to help make that selection. Then we'll ask you to notify those subrecipients. We're gonna to have to have some interviews. We're gonna to need to meet, talk with folks. We wanna learn how they do their program. We wanna see how the money is being effectively in place to support the homeless in your area, okay? So we'll ask you to notify them. We'll need them available. And we will need in writing to see what staff is funded by which grant year. That's when we start to pull that source documentation Mark spoke of, Jill spoke of, when we'll need to see evidence. You guys hold on to that word. It's everything with monitoring. Give me proof it happened. All we need to see, just show us evidence. Um, make sure that we'll, the actual source documentation is gonna be available. Um, I went to monitor an entity, and when we showed up, they said, oh, we don't have any paperwork. We have nothing. That review kind of escalated to a different type of review now. <laughs> We're the federal government. So as much as possible, you want to make sure that you can at least produce uh, how you're doing things and then the evidence to show us that that's how it was done. Um, we said that we would be remote monitoring. We're being very safe like everyone else. Uh, the federal government has not lifted that, so we're gonna start monitoring in a remote capacity. On-site may happen later, but are you remote monitoring your subrecipients? Do you know, have they been able to send documentation to you? Do you feel comfortable that the person cutting the checks, paying the rents, um, is doing it in a way when you go visit them that they can produce the same information to you, okay? So preparation is key. 
from the recipient level to the sub-recipient level. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And here's the wonderful thing. I love this picture. Doesn't it make you just wanna to go to the beach? So if you're not being monitored this year, before you say, yay, they're not coming, keep in mind that we will be. It's just a matter of when and how. Will we request information because we're doing remote or are we bringing a team of five people to sit down with you for a week to read every document you give to us, okay? It's just a matter of when and how. So while you're celebrating, create internal quality checks, those wellness checks, the self checks. How do you ensure that everything your organization touches is being run appropriately? There was another question that came in the q and I want to hit real quick. And the question was, how much documentation does the recipient need to see before they process an invoice. So give you an example. We have a lot of recipients that are really large. For example, I'm gonna say a balance of state. So a balance of state might get a lot of money and they pay a lot of cities and counties. Well, the cities and counties don't do the service provision, so they pay nonprofits. Well, we're gonna to need to see all of that. And we do have the expectation that you're seeing all of that. So if you're not being monitored yet, just hold on. Let's go to the next slide. Subrecipient oversight and monitoring. Gonna share some love with Nora Lally. Go ahead to the next slide because she was gonna step in and prepare to share her heart for how we can support the subrecipient capacity. So first, something to think about. The fact that many subrecipients might be new to ESG. Or what about those that aren't new to ESG? but they're learning how to electronically do everything because of a capacity or because of the pandemic or because of city county official restrictions. They can't get to the hard copy paperwork. So now they're trying to figure out how to do things in other ways. Can you take those uh, issues and help make it a strength? This is a great time to know the capacity of your subrecipients and their record keeping ability. We are certainly in a public health crisis, safety first. So everything will move forward in a way that is safe first. We re will request information, as Mark said, there's been a portal that's been established for uploading that information. Gonna throw this out there, the people who have access to that portal are usually your financial folks, those that have EDOX access. So that's been a little bit different because it's not your program people. But I believe I heard uh, Jill say earlier, Monitor with your program and your financial folks so that you're making sure everything is cohesive. Capacity of your subrecipients, man, at this time might have been stretched, but that doesn't always have to be a deficiency. It can just help elevate awareness to what needs to be strengthened. So formalize how you're monitoring. Formalize how you monitor yourself as the one who cuts the checks, as the one who is responsible for your subrecipients, and then help your subrecipients formalize how they do it. Policies and procedures, write it all down. Because when we show up, that's the first thing we're gonna ask for. Give us what you have that's in writing so that when we go forward, we can assess, okay? Consider the risk, how you determine who you're gonna see. Let me give you an example. That balance of state I referenced a little while ago, who funds cities and counties and they have subrecipients? Well, let's say that balance of state has 20 subs. Well, you might not have the capacity to internally monitor 20 subs. So how do you determine who you're gonna see? Do you have folks that possibly have housing issues? You're, you've been made aware that a lot of clients have had to be relocated because of substandard housing. High risk indicator. Are there folks you're paying that are not giving you invoices back timely? Or maybe they just don't have the capacity to make sure that they can. All right, and corrective actions is something that you're gonna get in our letters as well. We're not gonna, uh, and we recommend that you do the same with your subrecipients. We're not just gonna tell you, you gotta fix it. We're gonna tell you how to fix it. Next slide. As I push forward through this subrecipient monitoring, you know, the internal rule is public. That's information that you have readily available. So consider walking through the requirements with your sub recipients. 
How um, is the stuff is the uh, staff receiving training? Do they understand the reasonableness test? Do they understand how to review and document? Do they understand the requirements of the enforcement requirements that's in 576-501? Do they understand that monitoring is not an option? Is basically what that entire regulation is saying. Next slide. When you assess your, your subrecipients, document it, determine who you're gonna see, when you're gonna see them, and then be able to target the best ones and the ones you need to hit first. Remember your administrative records. Remember how important risk is, because again, when you monitor in-depthly, we want to see why you chose that entity to decide to monitor. And when you have those, maybe you decided not to see for three years later, why was that one a no risk? Okay, go ahead to the next slide for me. These slides will be made available to you since we're coming to the home stretch and there's time capacity. I'm just going to punch them. It's okay. They know how, I'm the closer. So when you formalize all of your documentation for monitoring, when you make sure that everything is included, your processes, your staff that's going to touch it, consider your voucher process, the quarterly reporting process, your data quality, who is mentioning, who is entering your data and their training. Consider how it's all documented so that not only again, when we show up or any other federal entity, it's all readily available. The next slide talks about the corrective actions I mentioned. So I'm not gonna stay here long. It's just to make sure that you internally already have ways that you can address with your subrecipients how they're gonna fix a deficiency. Training is always first updating policies and procedures. And these are what we use. So if we identify a deficiency while we're monitoring you or your subrecipient, we're gonna tell you to correct this, we need you to train your staff, give us evidence you train them, update your policies and procedures, send them to us so we can see them, those type of corrections, okay? And then my last uh, slide before I get to move it on over back to Marlisa, there are some tips that was mentioned earlier. CDBG has taken time to build a guide. There are other guides that's out there. I wanna encourage you to do some peer research, Google documents and see what pops up that maybe someone in your locality or community might be using that you can not only partner and connect because you're touching those same homeless people, but that you can also adapt, okay? Let's talk about resources. Am I kicking it back to Marlisa? Hey everyone, I hope I'm not too frozen. I'm having some internet issues, but next slide, please. Next slide. We wanna take this opportunity just to run through very quickly some existing resources. You'll have them for your reference once the slides become available, but of course use the monitoring exhibits chapter 28 and stay tuned for the updated uh, ESG CV specific exhibits. Um, pay particular attention to chapter 34 and chapter 24 for financial management and lead-based paint. And the link is there. Next slide, please. These are some uh, I materials that we've curated for you as especially helpful in uh, monitoring preparation. So the expense tracking tools, um, the virtual binders, which we're continually adding to, so keep checking back, and some materials on adjusting your written standards for ESG CV. That helps with actual language that you could use to update your written standards. Um, we mentioned the PPR tieback resource. Um, next slide, please. And we have a number of materials that are coming soon. So this is a snapshot of ones we're working on finalizing. So we hope to be able to share these with you in the upcoming weeks. Make sure that you're signed up for the HUD.gov listserv as well as the HUD exchange listserv using um, ESG as a subject that you're interested in receiving news about. We, um, we basically flag any new resources that have been posted to the HUD exchange using those, um, especially the HUD exchange listserv um, notification process. So um, the other thing is that you all have asked some really great questions and any, any answers that we have not been able to provide within this webinar, 
please submit to the um, HUD Exchange Ask a Question feature, and we will be sure to get responses out to you. With that, I am going to turn it over to um, Karen de Blasio to uh, close us out. Karen? And Karen, I think you're on mute. Hey, Karen, you're still on mute. So we're missing your words of wisdom. We can't hear you. Karen, I think you came off mute, but you don't have audio. You may be double muted. So it may be that you're muted on your phone. So while we're waiting for Karen to be able to, to join us or, or not, um, we've tried to answer as many questions as we could in the chat, but we just want to thank you all for all of your good questions and thank you for all the good work you're doing. And as Marlisa said, we will try to get as many of these questions that aren't already in the ask a question posted as we can. Um, so uh, please be patient with us. This is a new platform for all of us and we've been trying to get to them. Um, but, um, but I know that I can speak for Karen and just thanking you all for your commitment, everything that you're doing. We hope to uh, continue open conversation with you through the AAQ, through SNAP's um, Friday office hours. Thank you so much for sticking us, with us through two hours, and we hope that we've provided some information and support for you as um, you gear up for monitoring season. Thanks so much, and this concludes our webinar.